welcome. If peace were breaking out, would we have this many people turn out for one of our <laughs> events? <coughs> um, felicitous timing. The conference is now in silent mode. Almost. <laughs> so we have. Um, So we have a, by, by way of clarification, we have a, a large phone-in constituency today as a part of this uh, discussion. And we welcome the joint staff uh, colleagues and associated institutions from around the country. Welcome to all of you. Uh, this is the latest in a series of speakers we've had on the general subject of Iran's nuclear future, uh, where we're trying to explore the prospects for Iranian nuclear restraint and the instruments of leverage of the United States uh, over Iranian choices. Uh, the topic is, of course, uh, especially timely uh, given the latest developments. Uh, and um, our speaker is um, going to focus his opening remarks on the, the original intended focus of the, of the discussion, which was about sanctions policy, um, but uh, we'll, we'll set out some broader remarks and we'll take the conversation uh, wherever we'd like to go. Um, Richard Nephew is uh, one of the nation's leading experts on sanctions. Uh, he, he literally wrote the book. Uh, if you like what he has to say, go buy his book, uh, which is called The Art of Sanctions. Uh, last year, Columbia University Press. Uh, he's a non-resident fellow in the foreign policy program at Columbia University. He has extensive government experience. He served at the White House at the National Security Council, director for Iran policy. He served in, in the State Department, uh, was the technical sanctions expert on the US team negotiating the JCPOA. He was a DOE where he participated in, among other things, the Libya dismantlement program activities. So he brings a wealth of knowledge and a high level of continuing interest in the subject of um, U.S.-Iran nuclear diplomacy. Uh, a few words about our rules of engagement today. First of all, there are still there are two empty seats up front for any of you standing in the back. Please, please come claim them. Uh, we have three people coming, so good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> will not make a joke about lab math. Um, we are on the record, so please be mindful in posing your questions. Uh, Richard's going to speak for approximately 45 minutes. Uh, please allow him to do so without interruption so he can set out the main structure of his argument. Uh, and then we'll go to Q&A for about 45 minutes. Please be, please be prepared, not with a short speech of your own, but with a, a point of interrogation that will move the conversation along. Um, his remarks are his personal remarks. Uh, he's speaking in his private capacity. We as the lab are happy to host and convene this discussion, uh, but this is uh, a, a venue for discussion of private views and to help get us started. Please join me in welcoming Richard Nuffy. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, and thanks very much uh, for everybody being here. I, I did want to uh, offer one clarification of something that Brad said. Even if you don't like what I say, please buy the book. I, I've, got, I've got three children with many teeth that need orthodontia. So. Um, you know, when, when we originally planned this conversation, uh, I started thinking about this last Thursday, yes, last Thursday, uh, when I was starting to write down what I was going to say. I wrote down there was no militia activity around the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. There was no Fordo nuclear restart. Uh, there were no protests leading to a violent crackdown in Iran. Or, and then I left myself a blank so I could write down anything else that would have happened in the intervening week. Uh, I would not have guessed what happened in the last week. Um, at least I would not have guessed that specifically. But um, even though Soleimani's death 
um, is in and of itself a bit of an unexpected twist in the story, as well as the actions taken by the United States subsequently, as well as the actions taken by the Iraqis subsequently, as uh, will likely be the Iranian actions to come soon. Um, even though those specific actions are a little bit unpredictable, the fact that we were moving down an escalatory path with the Iranians is entirely predictable, and in fact was predicted by many people. When the United States decided to exit from the JCPOA and reimpose the sanctions that we did, uh, starting in May of 2018. The fact that we are in a crisis mode with the Iranians now, I will reaffir reaffirm and restate, is entirely easy to predict based on everything we knew about Iran prior to uh, the JCPOA, everything we knew about Iran during the JCPOA, and everything that we have heard from the Iranians subsequent to U.S. withdrawal. All of these things make sense. The only question really was, what were the specific steps that were going to be taken by the United States, by our partners and allies, and be taken by the Iranians? The details are something that are worth thinking about, worth analyzing. The trajectory of the crisis, I think, uh, was something that was entirely uh, foreseeable. And in fact, I would say that Iran had made very clear for a number of years that if the United States ever decided to reimpose sanctions, they would choose to restart the nuclear program and potentially undertake a whole range of other activities prejudicial to our interests. They said so as we were negotiating the JCPOA. They said so subsequent to the fact. We just never, at least as part of the negotiating team, thought it would be the United States that would be exiting the JCPOA first and being the instigation for that. But the fact that there would be some back and forth between us and the Iranians, I think, was something that was entirely uh, foreseeable. So, even if we take that on as an assumption, and even if we think that the folks who decided that this was a good idea knew that there was going to get some pushback uh, from uh, the Iranians, that doesn't necessarily mean that the maximum pressure campaign, the maximum pressure strategy that's been barked upon by the Trump administration was in and of itself a flawed construct. I want to bear that out here for a second. The fact that they decided to exit the JCPOA and to deal with the fact that the Iranians were going to ratchet up is something that they potentially knew was going to happen and were completely comfortable with happening, but because they thought they had escalation dominance over the Iranians could manage the situation after that fact. So I don't think that there are people who entered in this situation entirely with ignorance or with no idea that this is a possibility. But I do think where there is a broader analytical disjuncture is the idea that this would be a controllable slide out by the Iranians and that we wouldn't have the same kind of real risk that we now face now of a broader regional confrontation. And I think that's in part because there was an expectation that the Iranians would eventually back down if facing massive economic dislocation, certainly facing U.S. military pressure and potentially uh, political pressure as well. And I think part of the reason why uh, that approach has at least thus far failed to motivate the Iranians to change their course is because though we have pursued a maximum sanctions pressure campaign, we actually have not pursued a maximum pressure campaign from the standpoint of bringing together all the various different tools of U.S. statecraft and U.S. partnerships to try and really make the Iranians have to adjust their behavior. In fact, some of the most important and most valuable aspects of U.S. policy, especially our diplomatic abilities to isolate the Iranians and to confront them with an international coalition, have been left to the side. And that comes in part from how we've decided to execute the sanctions policy that we've in fact executed. So the real question that we've got to then struggle with is actually two questions. First whether or not maximum pressure on Iran was going to ever get us the kinds of deal that the Trump administration had set out as its goal, and if it was something that ever had a chance of succeeding, whether or not this is just a flawed execution of that strategy. Right? And those are the two things I'm going to really focus on right now. First of all, I'll say that I think the idea of using maximum pressure against Iran to try and coerce it to make nuclear concessions is something that is completely reasonable and completely consistent with what we did under the Bush administration, under the Obama administration to get to the JCPOA. So I have no disagreement with the idea of using sanctions pressure against Iran. How could I? I helped design and execute it for a number of years and, in my opinion, 
it was effective in motivating the Iranians to make the changes that they made to their nuclear policies. But I think a critical distinction is while sanctions were an effective source of leverage and pressure on the Iranians, they were not the only thing that we were doing under the Bush and Obama administration to try and persuade the Iranians to come to the table. And when the Iranians came to the table, they came to one that was at least set with some degree of concessions and compromises that were an option from the United States. In other words, we were prepared to move a little bit in their direction to try and make a negotiated outcome possible. It's that combination of pressure and leverage building and giving the Iranians credible off-ramps that, in my opinion, made the Bush to Obama dual-track strategy, and it really was a continuity of, of Bush and Obama policy that led to the JCPOA in 2015 and the JPOA before 2013 that was successful, that is so distinct from what the Trump administration is doing, which is using only one half of our policy toolkit, that just being the use of sanctions itself. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the complications that have come up in the actual execution of, of the sanctions policy. First of all, one of the key problems in the Trump administration's sanctions execution thus far is the manner in which sanctions have been applied. And that starts with the fact there is no international support for those sanctions. None. None. Now, some of my Trump administration friends will say, ah, but we've got the Saudis, we have the Emiratis, and we have the Israelis. They don't count. Okay? Now, they certainly can count from the standpoint of political uh, support and giving us attaboys when we're putting pressure on the Iranians. There's no question of that. But do they count from the standpoint of communicating to the Iranians a need to transition their policies, a need to make change, a sense of political and diplomatic isolation, a sense of economic isolation, a, loss, uh, the, the, a sense of lost opportunity? Absolutely not. Why? The Iranians were not going to have business deals with the Israelis. The Iranians were not going to have business dealings with the Saudis and the Emiratis, except for in very discreet, very uh, disparate sorts of ways. They are not having the same sorts of economic and political relations with Israel that they have with China, that they have got with India, that they have got with Russia. So when we say that we're doing this without international support, what I mean is international support that has meaning in Tehran, that has meaning to convince the Iranians that they are isolated, that has meaning to convince the Iranians that they are standing against the entire tide of international public opinion. And some folks may say, why does that matter? Iran doesn't care about international public opinion. Iran doesn't care about international recognition because they're a terrorist state, because they lie outside of international, uh, the international community and so forth. It's hard for me to say anything other than that's simply not true, right? But it is simply not true. The Iranians actually do care about being recognized as a real country with real interests, with real sovereignty, with a real role in the international community. We in the United States might not like that. But that's actually not really here or there in terms of how the Iranians are perceiving the pressures that are being applied against them. They felt it very keenly when the Russians and Chinese were standing against them and voting with us in UN Security Council uh, deliberations. The Iranians felt it very cleanly, keenly when the Europeans were refusing to do business with them for all those years. When the Indians decided that they were going to stop doing business with Iran and stop clearing transactions with them in 2010 and 2011. And I remember it very clearly. The press reports coming out of Tehran were one of shock and, and horror about how they had been betrayed by the people that they thought they had a good relationship with and certainly could. So the Iranians do perceive value in being accepted as part of the international community. Certainly the uh, current government does. And in fact, we have as proof of that the fact that the Iranians, despite the provocations that are coming from the United States across the board, continue to try and find ways to build up their international support and their perception of international support. Take, for instance, the announcement of a couple of days ago when the Iranians said that they are going to no longer respect any of the JCPOA restrictions with respect to the nuclear program. What did they also add in, though? They're going to continue to allow IEA inspectors into the facilities. Now, if this was simply a matter of rejecting the JCPOA because they don't like the JCPOA anymore, there's no reason on the, uh, on the earth for them to do that. But the Iranians 
perceive that there is value to them for being seen as transparent internationally and allow the international inspectors to come in to document the fact that while in fact they're engaged in more nuclear activities, they have yet to break out for a bomb, right? And that they are actually complying with their MPT obligations, which is folks in this room generally don't need to be reminded of, but some audiences do. Do not actually prohibit Iran from having uranium enrichment, heavy water reactors, so on and so forth, right? They prevent bombs, they don't necessarily prevent these sorts of facilities. From that standpoint, the Iranians very clearly see value in having an international presence and international support. And for a number of years, we saw value in that international isolation. But nowadays, we don't, and it is affecting the manner in which sanctions are being applied because that means rather than working with our partners to implement sanctions that we have commonly assembled using the UN Security Council as a vehicle to do so, we're instead going to them and saying, your companies need to stop doing business in Iran because we said so. And if you don't think that has a bearing on enforcement, I got to tell you, you're wrong. Because I've spent an awful lot of time talking to international companies and more importantly, talking to governments and saying, what we're asking you to do in stopping this business deal with Iran or stopping that business deal with Iran isn't just about U.S. policy, it's about U.N. Security Council obligation. And while we in the United States sometimes look at Security Council resolutions and are a little dismissive, while folks in Russia and China might have similar sorts of views, I can assure you that when you are talking to people in Europe, talking to people in Africa, Southeast Asia, when you're talking to Canada, you're talking to a number of different countries around the world, they take seriously the fact that the UN Security Council has decided to act. The absence of that kind of international support from a legal standpoint and certainly from a political standpoint means that we have to instead say it's because we said so. And that is always going to be inherently much more difficult to convince people to abide. And as I'll get to later on, that has got grave repercussions for US sanctions policy going into the future. The other problem that comes up is that we've got enforcement inconsistencies and enforcement confusion, which leads to situations like, for instance, sanctions imposed against a Chinese shipping line at the end of September that caused all sorts of international shipping disruptions and economic dislocations from those that were transporting natural gas and uh, oil out of the Middle East. The fact that we decided to impose sanctions on the shipping line without having any interaction with the Chinese to potentially get them to stop facilitating some Iranian oil sales because it would be prejudicial to trying to get Iran to resolve our concerns with the nuclear program, et cetera, et cetera, which were the talking points that we used under the Bush and Obama administration. Instead, we simply impose a diktat, and then once we've thrown that ball, have to look and see where it's going to potentially land. And in this case, the where it landed was having uh, oil prices uh, go up, having shipping prices go up, having companies have to cancel a number of contracts affecting US business interests as well as Chinese business interests, all at the same time that we're trying to deal with the trade war. And that's just one isolated example of the enforcement difficulties that are created when instead of having a dialogue with other countries about how to do sanctions, you're simply giving them a list of things that they ought to be doing or not doing. So that automatically, in my view, means that your maximum pressure campaign is already going to be to some extent deficient because you are hindering yourself to only what US law would require countries and companies around the world to abide by, as opposed to what they potentially would be willing to do on their own. Second, and I spoke to this a little bit in the beginning, but I, I, it, it, to me, it's, it's absolutely crucial. We have offered through this maximum pressure campaign absolutely no credible off-ramps for the Iranians, right? Let's step back and have a sanctions 101 theory discussion. <laughs> sanctions are about building up leverage on the other side so that they will make concessions, right? At least that's the theory. Certainly that's the theory when you're saying that we're placing them in a negotiated uh, and diplomatic context. Certainly that's how we've used sanctions for a number of years. They are not traditionally, and certainly haven't been as we attach them to Iran, about trying to collapse regimes, right? They are not about attempting to have regime change, right? And according to this own administration, that is not the focus of US sanctions policy with respect to Iran now. US policy right now, according to the President of the United States, all the way down, is about getting Iran to come back to the table to give a better deal 
to this president than they were prepared to give to the previous president. Now, someone helped negotiate the JCPOA. I'll be a little bit skeptical that there's a better deal out there. Maybe there was a 10% better deal that could have been achieved. Maybe there was a 10% less better deal that could have been achieved. I don't really know. I am skeptical that without giving more concessions, we potentially could have gotten a stronger deal from the, uh, uh, from the Iranians. But that is just a supposition on my part. That is something that I believe on the basis of seeing what the Iranian policy has been like for a number of years, seeing what their red lines have been about how they want to have their nuclear fuel cycle and so forth. I'll admit I could be wrong. Could be that there is a better deal that was potentially out there. I will say I don't think the better deal that's out there is that Iran agrees to no uranium enrichment, no uh, reactors that are not fueled directly by uh, foreign supply, no fuel cycle activities of uh, any note, no interactions with Hezbollah, no interference in uh, the affairs of other uh, countries in the region, um, wholesale changes to governance structures, human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the 12 points that Secretary Pompeo laid out in May of 2018 would constitute an acceptable agreement to the United States. Now, he said at the time, these are the things that we think any reasonable agreement would include. These are the things that any state ought to be willing to take. These are common international standards that ought to be held. Okay, it may be that these are common international standards. It may be that uh, some countries would agree with you. I think a number of countries would not agree, especially when it comes to issues of fuel cycles and, force and so forth. But I think what's completely lacking in credibility is another part of this conversation, which is, and Iran has to agree to do all these things at once, right? So this isn't an agreement on some nuclear things, followed by an agreement on Hezbollah things, followed by an agreement on missile things, followed by an agreement on human rights things. This is an agreement in which Iran fundamentally changes its nuclear, regional, and domestic policies all before they get any sanctions relief from the United States, right? <laughs> and all supposed to happen at the same time. I can assure you that there was no likelihood that the Iranians were going to accept that kind of deal. But that was set up not just simply as the high watermark of ambition, but as the deal that would permit the United States to grant any kind of sanctions relief. And as we saw in the case of North Korea, there's been no indication from this administration that they're willing to slice and dice this agreement. Well, I gotta say, I find that practically difficult to see in any event. I don't know how a negotiation could take place across all those various different issues all at once, certainly without trading across those issues. But even if that could be achieved, you then have to come back to the fundamental issue of Iranian psychology and whether or not the Iranian diplomatic uh, position and negotiating position was ever going to take on these kinds of steps uh, that were being required of them, which to my view is simply not credible. So from an Iranian perspective, what they heard was there is a potential to get out of maximum pressure, but that means that you have to fundamentally transform your country and accept all U.S. unilateral demands, and you must do those now before there is any kind of a sanctions relief that could potentially uh, be conveyed to you, any kind of indication that we are willing to make any concessions to you and to your interests. And from an Iranian perspective, they saw that and immediately said, well, we don't really know why we'd even bother with the negotiation. But let's say for the sake of argument, that that was their position in May of 2018 before the sanctions pressure had hit. And some people in and around the Trump administration said, yeah, they're going to say that. And they said that to you. And you still got a JCPOA out of it. So let's see. Let's see. Let's apply the pressure and let's go from there. Okay. The problem then comes in to how other international negotiations are being viewed by the Iranians when they think about how they might have to deal with the Trump administration. Now, I know a lot of people in this room are going to immediately think, ah, North Korea. He's going to talk about North Korea. He's going to say that maybe the Iranians will look at the North Korea case and say, that's the lesson we need to learn. We need to develop more chits and then respond. Maybe that's part of it. But actually, the case that the Iranians bring up, NAFTA and NAFTA extension. What the Iranians have said was, part of the reason why we don't believe that there are any credible off-ramps to negotiating prospects with the United States is because how you negotiated with the Canadians and the Mexicans, right? Especially Mexico, where after you even had a trade agreement that solved the trade issues that were supposed to be covered in it, you came back and said, we also need an agreement that deals with immigration and deals with migration-related issues. What the Iranians have said is, 
we simply don't believe that even if we made concessions across all the 12 steps that have been outlined by Pompeo, that you won't come up with number 13, and that you won't come up with number 14, and you won't come up with number 15. And that is because, more fundamentally, there is no perceived off-ramp by the Iranians because they believe that the Trump administration has decided that only regime change is a satisfactory approach to dealing with the Iranian nuclear issue. And they don't care how many times the president has said, we are not going for regime change. Part of the reason why they don't care is because they look at a number of comments that have been made by the president, which could seem to be contradictory, depending on how you read them, or hear them, or see them in tweets. Um, but they also look at the body work for the entire administration. They look, for instance, at Ambassador Nikki Haley in September of 2017 gave a speech at the American Enterprise Institute in which she said the problem with the JCPOA is not actually the nuclear problem. It is the Iranian government problem. It's the fact that you can't trust these folks, that you can't actually reach an agreement with this government. This is the similar kind of position that's been taken by former National Security Advisor John Bolton, by the Secretary of State, and by other officials in the uh, U.S. government at various different lower levels. So for when the Iranians look at the U.S. position, they may hear some words that look like there are off-ramps, but they don't actually see those off-ramps as being terribly credible, and they don't actually believe that the Iranians would be, or the Americans would be prepared to accept the kinds of terms that uh, the Iranians would insist upon, even if they made a lot of sweeping concessions. And Iranian internal politics magnify the problems attached with all this. Because though we tend to think of Iran as a monolith, Iran is absolutely not that. There's a number of different political uh, factions inside of Iran, of which President Rouhani is only the leader of one. And all the other various different factions inside the government are always vying for some degree of control over policy. And they're all appealing to the supreme leader. And the supreme leader, more often than not, tries to arbitrate between them by giving some to one side, giving some to another side on various different issues. The one thing that he gave to President Rouhani was you may negotiate with the Americans. And he said at the time, I don't trust them. I wouldn't negotiate with the Americans. You want to? Go for it, right? But he said, don't blame me when this blows up in your face, right? So not only do we have people out there now who are saying to the Supreme Leader, Rouhani got duped, right? He got taken in. The Obama administration pulled him in, and the Trump administration then came back and dropped the hammer, just as Trump would, did to the Mexicans and potentially do to you again. But now we've also got the problem that the Supreme Leader himself is being confronted with policy demands from the United States that he doesn't believe are serious or credible, a, an administration that he doesn't believe will stick to agreements that are actually reached, and that he views anyway involve concessions that are prejudicial to his view of what Iran should actually be about. So all that adds up, in my opinion, to a very low likelihood that maximum pressure, as it's currently constituted, as it's currently being implemented, is going to get the Iranians to make the kinds of concessions necessary in negotiated agreement in order to make any of this uh, go the right direction. In fact, I think it's much more likely that things are going to go in a much more escalatory path. But let's think a little bit more about what maximum pressure could achieve. Well, maybe maximum pressure could, over time, collapse the Iranian economy, right? Certainly, if you look at economic statistics, there are reasons to believe this to be the case. The Iranian economy is in utter shambles. Okay? That you can have some degree of confidence in when the Trump administration comes out and says the Iranian economy is in the pits. They've got all sorts of problems from unemployment problems to you know, no GDP growth. In fact, they've got a massive recession underway to the fact that they've got a massive inflation problem. All of that stuff is, possibly, is, is true. And the Iranians are dealing with the economic effects of all of that. So I think it's reasonable to assert, reasonable to argue, that maximum pressure combined with Iran's long-term systemic economic weakness has created a situation in which they are very near to economic collapse. That is not the same thing as political collapse. And all too often when sanctions are being considered, we equate them. Now, I think part of this, and I wrote about this a little bit in the book, 
Part of this is because we in the United States in particular have got warped views about what bad economic situations look like, right? So let me, actually, this will be fun. Um, let me see a show of hands. Who thinks 10% unemployment is a bad thing? Hands? Do we think that? Okay. Who thinks 20% unemployment is a bad thing? <laughs> right? Who thinks 30% unemployment is a bad thing? <laughs> All right. So we got like everybody. The Iranians have been dealing with about 40% unemployment for the last 20, 30 years. Right? It's come and gone, right, over time. But it's been pretty bad for a long time. If you were to tell the Iranians right now, I'll give you 20% unemployment. They would say, all right, we're pretty good. Who thinks that 5% inflation is a bad thing? Anyone? All right, we got some hands. All right, 10% inflation is a bad thing? All right, okay. The Orion's have been dealing between 20 to 40% inflation, right, year on year for many, many, many years, right? And I could do this exercise a number of times with GDP growth, with um, uh, exchange rate uh, values, et cetera, et cetera. The upshot is no two economies are alike, but certainly neither are two impressions of the same economy, right? And that's because we enter in with a set of expectations that 5% unemployment is a reason why we throw the bums out, right? If the Iranians had 5% unemployment, they would dedicate shrines. <laughs> and, and the upshot is that from an Iranian perspective, they have to think about what would happen in the circumstance that they didn't have the kinds of economic uh, situation they've got at present, not just could it get much better or could it get much worse. They are thinking on a relative scale that we simply are not uh, uh, built to think about. And it's part of the reason why when we hear about some of these economic statistics coming out of Iran, we go with 20% unemployment, they've got to be getting ready to get the pitchforks out, right? Venezuela is another good case in point, right? Venezuela has been dealing with unambiguously bad economic situation for a number of years and total economic collapse for at least the last four years. Yet President Nicolas Maduro is still in charge there. Which takes me to my second point. Just because you have economic collapse does not mean you've got regime collapse because you still have to overcome the fact that those are the guys with the guns, right? And in the Iranian case, as we saw with the protests, they are fully prepared to use those guns to reassert power and to keep control of the population. There is no reason to believe in the Iran case that maximum pressure, even if it brought Venezuela level economic situation uh, uh, to foot, would actually result in a national collapse and a political collapse in the country having regime change, right? The Iranians have been dealing with bad economic situation for a long time. Venezuelans have been dealing with it for a long time as well. There's an awful lot of force and a number of people who are prepared to use it. In fact, as Kareem Sajidpour, um, a, a scholar at Carnegie, um, has said before, one of the things that we've seen is, as compared to the 1970s, when the Iranian population was prepared to die and the Iranian government was not prepared to kill, we've seen the complete opposite, where the Iranian government is prepared to kill and the Iranian population has, thus far, not been prepared to die. And all that adds up to the fact that while you might have economic problems and while you might have political foment, that doesn't necessarily add up to the fact that the government would potentially lose uh, uh, control. They have got people in charge uh, who are fully prepared to use force to stay in charge. And the population, on top of all that, also has to think about what happens the day after. And you might think that they are only focused on their own situation, but quite frankly, they spend a lot of time thinking about Syria, and they spend a lot of time thinking about Libya. And one of the things that we have seen, and we've seen this from a variety of different sources, anecdotal stuff, but also uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, some polling data as well, is that one of the big concerns of the Iranian population is they do not want to experience a Syria situation. They do not want to experience a Libya situation. While they think the Islamic Republic government is not a good one, and they're not happy there, and they're not necessarily happy with the level of governance that they're getting, they don't necessarily want to take the kinds of risks that would be required in order to get to a revolutionary state that potentially leads to a Libya and Syria, right? Because while it, things are bad, that's much, much worse. On top of all that, there is no unified opposition in the country. And that means that even while you might have national problems, even though you might have economic problems, even though you might have governance problems, that still does not add up to a decision to 
take the kinds of steps necessary to foment revolution, to try and get guns and shoot at guards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if maximum pressure can bring about economic collapse, but it can't necessarily coerce political changes and political concessions, if no small part because there are questions about the integrity of any offers coming from the United States, what can maximum pressure do in the meantime? Well, certainly it can lead to a nuclear weapons capability being developed inside of Iran, right? And we're seeing this by the restart of the various different nuclear activities by Iran over the course of the last seven months. Now, I'll say I remain surprised that the Iranians were as patient as they were, considering the U.S. sanctions uh, decisions starting in May of 2018 and ramp up of sanctions throughout uh, uh, the time until May of 2019 when the Iranians decide that they were going to start uh, withdrawing from parts of the JCPOA. But that patience has come to an end, and now we are back on the path of Iran building up towards uh, having a breakout capability. Now, right now, if you, some folks in this room probably know this a hell of a lot better than me, but I'll say, for the sake of everybody, right now Iran's probably at 11 months or so away from having a nuclear bomb if they chose to do so, right? In terms of where their fuel cycle is, in terms of what we've long assessed was their nuclear weapons uh, uh, sophistication in terms of weaponization and so forth. As the Iranians build up their stocks of enriched uranium and build up their stocks and, and installed centrifuges and operating centrifuges, obviously that breakout time is going to drop. My own personal guess is that the Iranians will take steps to make it basically what it was pre-JCPOA, two to three months away from a bomb uh, by the end of this year. And if you think about it, that essentially means that um, we'll be back to where we started uh, in November of 2013 before we had the JPOA. The second thing that can happen as a result of maximum pressure is a lot of conflict and violence in the region. We've certainly already seen that the Iranian decision um, to retaliate to the United States um, and to our partners who they um, believe uh, helped contribute to our decision to withdraw from the JCPOA has been to attack energy infrastructure. We saw this with the attack on the Avcake facility in uh, uh, the, the September timeframe. We just saw it against, uh, with the attacks against Saudi and other tankers uh, you know, throughout the summer. Uh, that have been attributed to Iran. We've seen this with regard to provision of missile systems and other things to um, the uh, Yemeni Houthis who have you know, launched them at uh, you know, Riyadh Airport, et cetera. Um, and I don't think, even prior to the assassination of Ghassan Soleimani, that we were going to see a reduction in those sorts of uh, activities. I absolutely think after Soleimani uh, was killed, that we are going to see the Iranians choose to ratchet up there as well. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we probably have got more missile attacks that are going to be incoming on uh, our service people uh, and our diplomatic installations in the region. That means that we uh, almost certainly are going to see additional attacks or threats to attack energy infrastructure. And I also think we're going to see a step of Iranian uh, terrorist activity and terrorist support activity uh, outside of the Middle East. It's worth noting that um, you know, some folks will think about the Iranians as limiting their activities mostly to the region, but in fact, when the Iranians believed that Israeli Mossad was assassinating their nuclear scientists throughout 2011 and 2012, the Iranian decision to respond was not against Tel Aviv. The Iranians instead decided to go after Israeli targets in Bangkok, in Bulgaria, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that is because the Iranian Quds Force believes it's a global force and does have global capability, and they're prepared to use it. That, in my opinion, is what maximum pressure can potentially achieve. It goes without saying that I do think that this means that the U.S. ought to change its approach, right? And that U.S. policy ought to be adapting in order to uh, make what pressure has been uh, achieved more effective by adding things like an offer that is seen as credible and serious to the Iranians to negotiate. It could potentially take the form of the joint plan of action, the initial agreement that we reached in November 2013. Um, there are other things that we could potentially do. I think the Iranians are up for restructuring the JCPOA. Um, I certainly don't think they're up for doing that in the context of the maximum pressure campaign um, going unabated. But as part of an exchange of relaxing those sanctions, the Iranians even said uh, yesterday they'd be prepared to do that. I think that's all a lot harder to uh, believe in the context of Soleimani's death. But I do think that is still where the Iranians potentially may go with respect uh, to um, the, the nuclear program if we would be prepared to make those kinds of concessions. I think just at this point, that's not part of where U.S. policy is likely to go.
So that's the implications for U.S. Iran policy. Let me say a few words uh, in my last couple minutes about the implications for U.S. sanctions policy, which I spend an awful lot of time thinking about, in part because I am deeply concerned that the steps that are being taken by the United States, particularly in this administration, but even the previous ones, are ultimately to our uh, detriment in, in having sanctions as a potential tool that we can use. We and our European partners in particular have badly split over Iran sanctions. And that's going to be a headline that folks will pay a lot of attention to. They are not the only source of a split between the United States and Europe when it comes to sanctions policy. When you actually look at the whole range of U.S. sanctions that are currently in place, you can see more examples of the United States and Europe um, at loggerheads than you can necessarily see us cooperating, certainly in this administration. We've got also differences of view with regard to Venezuela. We've got differences of view with regard to Russia, in particular sanctions that have been imposed against the Nord Stream 2 natural gas pipeline. And we've got a number of different concerns being expressed by Europe that at this point the United States isn't even bothering to consult with them when it comes to deciding about whether and how to implement new sanctions. That's not very good. But it's part of a broader U.S. willingness to use sanctions in basically any circumstance that we seem fit without necessarily engaging most of the world to decide whether or not it makes sense and whether or not the sanctions are something that they would potentially be prepared to support. With the exception of North Korea, this administration in particular has been very neglectful of going to the UN Security Council to try and get support behind a number of the sanctions initiatives that it's pursued. Now, to its credit, it's not been getting a whole lot of help from the Russians and Chinese either, which only reinforces the unilateralist tendencies from the United States. But importantly, this whole dynamic predates the Trump administration. And this is where I'll be very explicit. This is not a Trump problem. This is not a Republican problem. This is not a Democrat problem. This is an American problem, <laughs> right? Because our perception, especially since the mid-1990s, is that the U.S. economy was so strong, so attractive, so diverse, and so valuable, no one could possibly do without it. So everyone would be prepared to do what it takes to stay in the U.S. good graces, and they'd be able to continue doing business with the United States. And to some extent for the last several years, that actually kind of worked, right? Because the U.S. is still the financial center of the world, because transactions do come through here, because people want access to U.S. technology, because people want access to U.S. services and to our educated population, et cetera, et cetera. But over the last 20 years, in my opinion, we have gone to that well for foreign policy reasons way too much. We have gone to sanctions to deal with policy challenges as diverse as Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, Libya, Syria, uh, China, India, and Pakistan. Let's not forget that. Uh, went to that well also to deal with uh, more kind of general problems of terrorism, human rights, uh, corruption issues, uh, trafficking uh, issues from narcotics to human trafficking. The list goes on and on and on. And as I like to tell my students, every one of those sanctions ideas is potentially meritorious on its own, right? We could have a healthy discussion here about who thinks that we should prioritize human rights sanctions versus who sh we should prioritize Iran sanctions or North Korea sanctions. People have different views. I'll say I think everything I just mentioned is something very valuable and very useful and something that, that sanctions ought to be able to try and address. But when you do go to the well to deal with all of those problems using sanctions, at some point, people start asking some fundamental questions. Who am I allowed to trade with anymore? And who are you to be telling me that I am only allowed to trade with this person, that person, or that person? A third question that's been asked, and unfortunately this administration has reinforced this, is, and are you just doing this to create market share for the United States? Right? <laughs> which actually was an accusation that a number of our European partners uh, made with regard to Iran sanctions for a number of years, with regard to China sanctions and other things, and for a number of years we were able to discount and say no, 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 and in fact, you know, if you look at our business dealings with them, we've ramped them all down, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, more recently, that's been harder to justify. The upshot, in my opinion, is that the excessive use of U.S. sanctions, particularly where the rest of our international partners disagree, not just don't agree, 
they actually disagree with what we are trying to do and how we're trying to do it, reinforces a desire to get away from the United States and the controlling influence that we potentially can have. And we're seeing this with regard to trade and people looking for alternative uh, supply chains that don't necessarily come from the United States, especially with the threats from this president that we're going to have tariffs on this, that, and the other. But we're also seeing a whole diverse array of potential services and other activities. We're seeing it with regard to banking. We're seeing it with regard to uh, insurance services. We're seeing it with regard to IT services. We're seeing this across a number of different industries as companies look and say, if I want to do business with this whole host of companies, I can't possibly still do business here in the United States or do business in the other place, so I've got to make a decision. And for the longest time, the United States was quite confident that the decision would be affirmative in our favor. I think as we see the global economy start to become a more, much more multipolar one, we are going to start to see that answer be maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe we do actually want to prioritize our business relationship with China instead. And that means a whole class of markets that we'll potentially do business with and a whole class of markets that we won't, but that's a choice that we potentially can make. We also potentially could see that with respect to the dollar as part of the global, uh, as, as the global reserve currency. Now, I don't actually think that we're approaching a situation in which people will not want to hold the U.S. dollar. It's still a very stable currency, very stable uh, a way of managing your wealth and keeping value and, and your reserves. But does that mean the United States will be in a position where people will only want to hold dollars, right? Or will see dollars as the supreme currency to hold? Potentially not. That will come with both political and economic consequences. Because once the United States is no longer at the center of global economic activity, that means that we're going to have to be competing with the Chinese, with the Europeans, with others, and they potentially aren't going to have all the impediments and all the complications in doing business that we have decided to create through our use of sanctions as a foreign policy tool. Of course, attached to all that is, the moment we're no longer at the center of that global economic web, our ability to pull those strings to put pressure on Russia, put pressure on Iran, put pressure on Venezuela, et cetera, is also potentially going to be reduced. Which means that we, by overusing sanctions today, are not only potentially undermining our position uh, with our partners right now, but potentially our ability to use sanctions as a tool going into the future. And that ought to disturb anybody who thinks that it's better for the United States government to have more options, especially more non-military options, and fewer. So, brief summary. I think that the maximum pressure campaign that has been embarked on by the United States is not intrinsically flawed from the standpoint of putting economic pressure on Iran. That certainly has got a lot of parallels to what we've done. But I do think the manner in which it's been used and the absence of international political support that it has, combined with some broader frustrations and irritations with regard to the U.S. use of sanctions more generally, ultimately is detrimental to U.S. sanctions policy and detrimental to the U.S. position internationally. I don't think that any of these things are irreversible. I certainly think that there is an opportunity to repair and rebuild our relationships with Europe, to have a different approach to sanctions, to have a different approach to Iran policy, and so forth. But I will say that over time, some of the things that we have done are going to become uh, parts of, of the international dynamic that we're not going to be able to get away from. And we're going to find that it's going to be much more difficult to convince Iran to negotiate with since 2021 than it was in 2015. That it's going to be harder to get people to join into sanctions policies with the United States in 2030 than it was in 2010. And all that means that the U.S. ability to influence policy decisions being made abroad to our own advantage and to our own national security interest is potentially going to be compromised. And that's why I think there needs to be some fundamental reforms to how the U.S. uses sanctions, to how we think about sanctions, and certainly how we apply them in this specific case with Iran. I hope that's helpful.